update each other with each other. Um, and it, it gets you succeeding. All right. We'll mess with the mic. All right. And we're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. All right. Welcome back for lecture three. And we have Ben Krieger again. Nice. All right. So is it enough to have a code that can just detect and correct Pauli errors? Uh, it is. And I will not prove this. Because the proof would be too long. And uh, it would have required too much studying for me to prepare. Man, when you're a student, they make you study. But now they pay me. They can't make me do anything. So I'll tease you a little bit with one thing that you can correct with a code that just corrects pallies. It's not a pally. And that is coherent rotation by a pally that is itself correctable. Right? So maybe some of you know already, probably most of you know, that like, I can have you know, u, p, theta equal to some exponential of i times a pauli times theta, some angle. Right? This is going to be some unitary operator. And uh, you can do a bunch of Taylor expansion and knowing that the square of a pauli is the identity to get that this is uh, cos theta times the identity plus i sine theta times p. So it's just some linear combination with complex coefficients of uh, operators. You know, One of them is a Pauli. What would happen if we applied this unitary to a stabilizer state that was stabilized by some stabilizer s, and then we measure s, and we assume that s anti-commutes with the Pauli? Uh, because spoiler alert, if s commutes with the Pauli, nothing happens. Right? So let's, let's set up s times cosine of theta identity uh, plus i sine theta uh, p acting on psi. Do we even need this thing? Ah, no, sorry. We're going to project into one of these two uh, spaces, right? Either the plus one or minus one projector, right? So we expand out. This is going to be equal to uh, cos theta i plus s, i plus or minus s over 2 times psi plus i. Uh -huh. Yeah. p sine theta i minus or plus, right? Because these anti-commute over 2 psi. Right. So a plus 1 outcome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then i plus s over 2 on psi gives us psi, right? Because s psi and i psi are both equal to psi, right? And if you have a plus 1 outcome, then you know, i minus s acting on psi cancels out completely. But if you have the minus 1 outcome, then this cancels out completely. And the resulting term, well, OK, so let me, let me write this down. Plus 1, uh, this will cancel out, and you'll get um, psi. Once you normalize, right, the square root of pj, et cetera. And then minus 1, you'll get uh, some term sine squared theta, p acting on psi. So whenever you measure a stabilizer that anti-commutes, even though there was some coherent rotation, right, the error is not just some pally that you apply. The projective measurement collapses you into a space that's spanned by vectors that are paulis acting on the original state. And you can just continue with your regular error correction formalism from there. The full proof that like, you can correct arbitrary dynamics is more involved, and it even involves non-stabilizer codes. Uh, and if you want to know more about that, you should look at chapter two of uh, Brun and Lidar. The book they edited. Yeah, they, well, OK. I would say they wrote the book on quantum error correction. They didn't write the book. They edited the book. But it is also called quantum error correction. Right? And there's like a teaser for the more general applicability of these stabilized codes. OK. So all this is to say that it is enough to correct Pauli's. Um, the remaining question should then be, you know, how many Pauli's can you correct with a certain number of qubits? Um, 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So Kiran showed in the last lecture that we can do with nine qubits. It says nins qubits in this PDF, but that's a typo. Uh, can we do better? The uh, one way to answer this question is by imagining uh, that each possible syndrome, right, every list of plus or minus ones or zeros and ones that you could get out of measuring your stabilizers corresponds to some unique Pauli error. Uh, let's imagine, well, okay. Let's imagine a code with k equals one. Did you cover what n, k, and d are? Okay, n, k, and d. I'm going to slip into saying n, k, and d, so I might as well tell you what they are right now. So n is the number of physical qubits involved in the code. Oh yeah, it was something I was supposed to introduce in my last lecture. k is the number of logical qubits, right? So you want n low and k high, and d is the distance, which is just the weight of a logical operator, the minimum weight, right? It's the number of things that have to go wrong before random dynamics have flipped your qubit completely and you have no chance of detecting it. So you want high d, high k, low n. For a code with k equals one, right? So if you have an n1d code, then there are n minus one stabilizers. You have, right, and the number of things that can go wrong, the number of Pauli operators, is three times n, right, x, y, and z for each n, plus one for the identity, right? The identity, you know, if nothing goes wrong, that has to give you a unique signal that's not the same as some error. Uh, so, you know, you have to be able to successfully get that nothing happened. Oh, the number of bit strings that we can measure is two to the n minus one, right? So the number of syndromes has to be greater than or equal to the number of errors that can occur, which is three n plus one. Whenever we have a discrete equation like this, I'm not gonna try and do algebra, I'm just gonna start plugging in values. Right, uh, well, okay, it doesn't make sense to have n equals zero. What about n equals one? You know, one is not greater than four. What about two? Uh, two is not greater than whatever this is. Uh, if you keep going, you'll note that the smallest value for which this equation can be satisfied, this inequality can be satisfied, is five. n has to be five or more. And as it turns out, there is a 513 code that, um, you know, that it just barely makes these equations. It's got 16 possible stabilizer syndromes, and there are 16 things that can go wrong, because three times five plus one is equal to two to the four. Uh, and here are the stabilizers, x, z, z, x, i. Right, so s, five. Uh-huh. And its logical operators are, well, there are three, there are weight three logical operators, but they look ugly. So I'm gonna write some symmetric looking, but not minimum weight logicals. People do that all the time. Uh, fun historical fact, this code on five qubits and the Shor code and the Steen code, which we're about to see, uh, were all derived first using ket notation before the stabilizer formalism was invented. Uh, so there, there really were people out there messing with nine qubit cats. Uh, luckily, you know, Daniel Gottesman saved us from all this and we don't have to do that anymore. Now we can add all kinds of overhead and still say that we know what we're talking about. Again, double-edged swords. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and we mentioned that the, the number of correctable errors is roughly half the distance, right? If you, uh, if in this, you know, distance three code, we were to have one error, we could assign a unique syndrome to it. But if you multiply that error by a logical, you may get a weight two error that has the exact same syndrome. So you would say it's less likely, but less likely is not impossible. So there's still gonna be some finite probability of failure, uh, no matter what code distance you use. Uh, the hope is that we decrease the uh, failure probability exponentially in the amount of overhead. All right, so that's one code. Kiran has used it. Um, did we do anything with the short code? Not yet. Uh, but the rest of the talk is basically going to be about what kind of codes you can construct and, and how easily. So, mm -hmm. should I talk about classical coding theory now? No. First, we're going to do a code that comes from some classical coding theory that I don't show you yet. The single parity check code, AKA the iceberg code. So, uh, single check. 
and or iceberg. Uh -huh. Right, so it's got n minus 2 logical qubits, right, which is a very large number of logical qubits. That's like the maximum you can have. Uh, but it's only distance 2. And you'll see why. Its stabilizers are uh, x. I'm going to use the, the O times in the exponent for you know, power. So this is like x, 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 x on everything. And then z on everything, right? So there's two stabilizers. And you know, we can see the four qubit code that I introduced in the last session was one of them. And if an x, y, or z happens on any qubit, one of these is going to anti-commute with it at least. But the syndrome is the exact same regardless of where that error happens. So you can tell that something has gone wrong but not where, and that's why it's distance two. Right. So there's one construction. These codes get used all the time, and they get used to construct bigger and better codes. So it behooves us to know about them. OK, now we're going to get into what Kiran was talking about, concatenation. Concatenation has got to be my favorite uh, code construction. And it, I mean, it generalizes. It, uh, it does all kinds of stuff. There are rules that once you learn them, you can break them. Concatenation is lovely. So what we saw Kiran do was take you know, the encoding Clifford for a single code. Here it's got one input wire, right? And what comes out is some you know, three qubit state. And then we take all these out here. We encode each of those qubits into some new code. And with this nice tree-like diagram, we can start to synthesize bigger and better codes that way. When we do this, OK. Let's imagine doing this to two arbitrary codes. Oh, where's that cloth? Here we go. Get rid of this thing for a second. So concatenation is going to be used to take a low-level code, which has n, l, k, l, and d, l, right, for low-level, and a high-level code with predictably, you know, n, h, k, h, and d, h, and you will get a code out, right, with the product, right, n, h, n, l, because for every high-level qubit, you need a low-level block, uh, k, h, k, l, uh, let's see, because, that's right, for every physical qubit of the high-level code, you need an entire block of the low-level code. So if, you're, uh, if your low-level code encodes like six qubits, and you want to encode into a 513 code, then it's not enough to take five qubits out of the six qubit block and put them into the encoding circuit, because uh, your pallies will get messed up and it will not work. Uh, we can get into it later in the Q&A if you like. What you have to do is get six blocks of the 513 code that you want to use, like this guy, and then take one logical qubit out of each of your uh, six logical qubit blocks and feed those in independently. And that's basically to ensure that um, in order for something to go wrong at the high level, it has to go wrong on separate blocks at the low level. Actually, OK, we can see the, um, I can see people are getting confused. So I'll, I'll give you the, the nucleus of this. So you have x1, x bar 1, is equal to xi, xi. x bar 2 here is equal to, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, let me go x, xii, and xixi. Okay. If I was to multiply these operators, 
I would get i x x i. So if I want to flip one of the logical qubits, then you know, I need to flip two qubits. If I want to flip the other logical, I need to flip two qubits. If I want to flip them both, I need to flip only two qubits. I don't have to flip four, right? So things go wrong at the logical level with different relative probabilities than they go wrong at the physical level. And so if you take uh, two qubits out of this block into a concatenated construction, then you can get a weight two error here with the same probability as a weight one error, right? Your, your error models become correlated and the assumptions that you make start to be invalid. And so the, the code will not correct as many errors as you might like. And that's why you have to have one full code block, at least in this naive construction, for every uh, physical qubit of the top level code. And of course, those physical qubits are replaced by kh logical qubits in every block. So you wind up with kh kl. Ah, the benefit of putting up with all that rigmarole is that you get dh times dl. Right, so uh, you can, if, when you want to construct higher distance codes, right, something with distance bigger than two or three, you can start taking products. Now, okay, I wonder if I should draw the circuits. Nah, I will leave figure one for people who are uh, looking ahead in the notes here as soon as I post them. But I will write out the stabilizer of the 422 code concatenated with itself. Right, so uh, if I take this 422, and concatenated with itself, I wind up with a code that was in a paper in 2022, I think. The Reichardt, the Prabhu and Reichardt distance four codes paper. Okay, so this is now state of the art. It may seem confusing, but you're now doing legitimate up-to-date research. All right, stabilizer of this code. Let me start at the top for some reason. It's gonna be x, 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 z, 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 uh -huh, uh -huh. You can see that even though it's not exponential, a quadratic amount of work can still be a lot. Also, a lot of your Pauli's wind up being sparse, right, affecting relatively few qubits. And so both you know, for your own by hand calculations and for computers, it's sometimes best to just have you know, x's and z's with indices on them to say where it's not equal to the identity rather than having to write out all the i's in the tableau yourself. This is a demonstration of that. Okay, so now there are eight logical operators to worry about. Oh, actually, sorry. We're not even done with stabilizers yet because this is just four independent blocks of the uh, 422 code, right? And you can see that because these, you know, these columns have identities below them, you know, identities in the rest here, this is you know, completely unentangled blocks. So this is distance two. If I apply two errors here, I, I flip one of these qubits. And I don't have uh, four qubits yet, I have eight. So four logicals, I have eight logical qubits right now. And what I have to do in order to finish the construction of the concatenated code is write the stabilizers of the top level code in terms of the logical Pauli's of the bottom level code. Okay, right? So this is like you can do whatever you want with these logical Pauli's. They act just like the physical Pauli's, one thing you can do is take tensor products of them and make stabilizers, okay? So, luckily, I have prepared this earlier, right? So here's, right, x, i, 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 z, z, i, 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 Yep. 
logical operators. You should go to pecos.io, but I am still going to erase the thing. I can sense the boredom. Have I done all of this for absolutely no reason? No. This is all to demonstrate that even though you know, we've gotten sort of fully up to date with state of the art techniques in the first lecture, constructing these tableaus, it gets cumbersome pretty quickly. You want to get a computer to do it if you can. This is a hackathon. You can maybe try that in a hackathon if you want to. Um, also, uh, this is why you often see quantum error correcting people work on little esoteric diagrams. So I'm going to switch. I mean, we switched from ket notation to um, stabilizer notation. Now we're going to switch again. But we're going to save a polynomial amount of work this time. Still worth it when you're working on a blackboard, because the quadratic speed up, you know, for slow operations like the ones I do with my clumsy human brain and hands. Right? Makes sense to do quadratic speed up. We can draw individual blocks of this 422 code. Let me put qubits on these little circles. And I'll have 16 of them in total. And if you stick them on a square, then they divide naturally into four groups of four. I can also draw, well, OK, so I'll say that there's you know, a, uh, an SX and an SZ hosted on each of these squares. And you can see, you know, obviously, that it's four qubits with two stabilizers. Therefore, it's got two logicals. You can even interpret the logicals geometrically. right? You can put an X bar here, and you know that the anti-commuting Z bar has to go over here. Then you can stick the, the other X bar up at the top. Right? Or you can multiply it by the stabilizer so that it overlaps on both qubits. But because it overlaps on both qubits, it commutes. Right? And you can stick a z bar over here. Right? And you can begin to say, oh, you know, I have these face-like stabilizers, and my logicals are on the edges. And you can start reasoning geometrically. Like, for example, when I want to produce a weight 4 stabilizer right, on these tiles out of logical operators, I can use x bar, x bar, x bar, and x bar. Right, so I can have vertical x's and create this sort of octagon in the middle. And I can have z bar, z bar, z bar, z bar, and create 
a little tile that crosses it. And because these things overlap on four qubits, they also commute. And I can also do, because there's an x that I can bring down here, x on this big octagonal tile and a z on that big octagonal tile. And that completes the stabilizer group, right? which is a lot easier than writing out a bunch of identities, right? which are an afterthought anyway. The logicals you can also visualize. right? Uh, what am I going to have? I'm going to have logicals here. X bar 1 and Z bar 2 are going to live right here. And overlapping on one qubit is going to be X bar 2 and Z bar 1. Right? So Z bar 1 and Z bar 2 commute because where they overlap is both Zs, but the other ones intersect on points. And I will also have logicals going down the sides of this lattice. Right? Uh, Z bar 3 and X bar 4 and x bar 3, z bar 4, right? Much more succinct, much more compact notation. You can see everything is length 4. Uh, if you wanted to, you could check out what, uh, this is something that we're in the middle of at the office at the moment. If you permute these qubits, there are some permutations that preserve the stabilizer group, right? Like if I, if I were to pick this entire lattice up off the board, flip it, and put it back down, you wouldn't, tell, you wouldn't be able to tell, right? The stabilizers would look the exact same, but some of my logical operators would move around. This thing would move down here. Uh, this would move up at the top. And you've got to wonder you know, whether there would be any non-trivial logical gates that you could do um, just by permuting the qubits, as, as you can do with really high fidelity in an ion trap. There are more pros and cons to concatenation. Uh, oh, OK, one of the pros is that uh, if you're in the scenario where you measure stabilizers perfectly and you learn some syndrome, then there's a decoder where you basically decode the low-level code first by brute force adding up every probability of every Pauli and assigning them into groups. And then you proceed up to the next level, uh, and you basically iteratively decode this gigantic code right, without ever having to consider all of the probabilities of all of the six qubit Paulis. Right? It, it, it sort of divides the decoding labor for you, and you can get an optimal statistical decoder that gives you soft decisions. There's a paper from 2006. I think one of our projects, I'm in charge of the projects, one of our projects is uh, replicating the results of that paper. So, I mean, not state-of-the-art research. It's 2006, but, you know, what you can do in a week. Okay, cons of concatenation. Why don't people use concatenated codes all the time? Uh, one is that they're, they're sort of... Um, they're sort of, you know, they're not very granular. They're not very fine grainable. You couldn't create a distance five concatenated code if you wanted to, right? At least not with this construction, right? Because five is prime. There is no product of two numbers that will get you to five. You also couldn't do three. And sometimes you do want to use a distance three code because uh, you don't have that many ions in your trap. Uh, so you can't afford lots of overhead and you want to see how well you can do at low distance, which is still pretty well. Um, also, as you add more layers, right, your, your distance grows exponentially, but so too does the number of qubits. And so uh, it's not very long before you're dealing with tables that you can't write down, diagrams that you can't put on the board, and things get really cumbersome. Uh, and so we're going to go to, uh, we're going to, go to even uh, you know, more formulaic code constructions. So instead of beginning with, all right, so this is, we're going to the next section now. I will ah, do one of these. So CSS. The CSS construction for quantum codes. This is another one of the pre-stabilizer constructions that I'm going to do in the stabilizer formalism just because it's easier. But if you read original work from the 90s, like the guy takes a classical error correcting code and you know, puts a ket on it. It's like nuts. Um, speaking of classical codes, I now need to do uh, classical coding theory in 10 minutes. There's a lot to classical coding theory. We're going to do a very small but very popular uh, subset, which is linear codes over F2. Okay, so CSS, but first, classical coding theory. Uh, classical code typically has... Uh, a parity check matrix called H. 
and a generator matrix called G uh, generator, such that, uh, let's see, in this lecture, H times G of T will be equal to zero. The rows of G will be in the kernel of H. And so, okay, and these are all gonna be bit strings. So if we were to do the repetition code, it would be like one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then if I took the vector zero, 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 obviously that would be in the kernel because you multiply everything by zero. But more interestingly, uh, and I should mention the all zero string is always a code word of every classical linear code. If I took one, one, zero, right, I would have one plus one, which mod two, because we're in F2, is zero. And I, one plus one is again zero. So this vector is also in the kernel. And those are the code words, right? So this would be H. And then my G. Uh, OK. G would be something like one, 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 where I think you're allowed to leave the all zero string implied. At least that's what I've done in the rest of these notes. Uh, there are a lot of more efficient constructions for distance three classical codes. I will, well, okay. Those in the know already know which one that I'm going to pick. It's the 743 Hamming code. And this, okay, there's a clever trick being used here. If I want to know where an error is, right, and I'm going to multiply this parity check matrix onto the error string, right, well, I, I should mention that if I, if I take some error, right, and I add some code word, and then I multiply by the parity check matrix, right, so these are each vectors, this is a matrix, it's all uh, over bits, the, uh, well, okay, this is going to be HE plus HC, uh, H times the code word. Code words are in the kernel of the matrix, right? So here I'm directly getting the syndrome of the error, right? No matter what code word I was trying to transmit, uh, which is a property that will turn out to be very convenient later. So let's imagine that I want H E to be distinct uh, on every weight one uh, E that I could put in. Well, okay, so if I take some matrix, and I multiply by uh, 0, you know, 1, and then a 0, then wherever this is, I'm just going to get out column J. So if I want to make a distance 3 code classically, I can just write down a bunch of distinct columns. And I mean, you'll note, here are a bunch of distinct columns in the repetition code. Let me try the same thing, but with three rows instead of uh, two rows, right? So 0, 0, 0 doesn't detect anything, right? So I'll start at 0, 0, 1. 1, 0, 1, 1. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And there we have 7, 4, 3, which is another NKD tuple, but there's no extra line here that denotes it's a classical code. And this is from Richard Hamming. Great. Why am I using this code? Because it has an obscure property also. Let me bring this in accordance with the notes by flipping the matrix front to back. Uh, H Hemming. G of the Hamming code. So it's got four orthogonal non-zero code words, uh, which means you can get a total of 16 messages in there. And you can determine whether, you know, given any seven-bit uh, noisy string, whether it's equivalent to one of these up to a weight one error just by multiplying on this matrix. Cool, but these are classical codes. How do we promote them into quantum codes? Uh, Kiran showed us how to do it with repetition codes. 
And it turns out that that generalizes to any classical code. Uh, we're going to start with these parity checks. And when you multiply them on with some error, there's a question of where does the error overlap with the parity check. And if you start multiplying polys together, you're going to notice that whether it commutes or anti-commutes reduces to the same question. Where does the error overlap with the poly that anti-commutes with it? Uh, let's transform the ones in the Hamming check matrix, in the Hamming parity check matrix, into zeds, and the zeros into identities. Now we can detect x errors that, can, that occur you know, in some arbitrary location. For example, iix, i, 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 right? You're going to get a syndrome because it anti-commutes with this check and this check, but not this check because there's an identity here, right? You're going to get a syndrome that's equal to the classical syndrome of putting a classical bit flip on this column here. You could do the same thing in the x basis. And these stabilizers commute. Uh, is it guaranteed that they commute? If I, if I was just to take some random matrix of zeros and ones, turn it both into zeds and x's, and then stick them on top of each other, would the stabilizers commute, necessarily? Sleeping guy in the fourth row. Do you know? Sleeping guy does not know. But the answer is no. Um, in order to get these stabilizers to commute, the code has to be what's called dual containing. You'll notice that the parity checks of this code also appear as code words. Right? These vectors are not only in the parity check matrix themselves, but they are in the kernel of that parity check matrix. Uh, dual containing is a very obscure property of classical codes, but we can see that it's related to making the stabilizers commute. There are lots of papers where people construct CSS codes. Right? This, by the way, is how you construct a CSS code. You take two classical codes that are related by you know, each one being in the dual of the other, and then you translate one of them to Z stabilizers, translate the other one to X stabilizers, stick them on top of each other. Um, there are plenty of papers where you construct CSS codes, and they, they always do some weird, obscure stuff that you can never tell why it's happening. Normally, why it's happening is in order to make the stabilizers commute. Uh, and we're going to see some weird, obscure stuff. Right. So first off, let's see what happens when we, um, uh, when we complete this code. So here's one vector, you know, one code word of this code that does not appear in the, um, in the parity check matrix. Sure enough, it becomes a logical. Right, so your logical x bar, right, your, or your z bar, right, these become x, 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 and z, 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 z. Huh? Uh, this was not as much of a mess as this thing. And these are also not minimum weight, but they're very symmetric. You can see that if I multiplied these two together, I would wind up with some weight 3x, right? And likewise, I have uh, some weight 3z uh, that I can cook up. And they always end to commute. Right? And this winds up being a 713 code. Right? So you're not using as many qubits as the short code. That's nice. And uh, it gives you access to, well, I mean, it gives you sort of difficult access to a, a decades-long literature of classical coding theory. Um, there are lots of tricks you can do. There are like product constructions, how to make the stabilizers commute. We're only going to do one trick because it's the one I understand as to how to make the stabilizers commute. And that is homological and topological codes. Anytime you're using a lot of words that end in logical, that's how you know you're doing, you're doing real science. What is the difference between homology and topology? I don't know. All I know is you get good codes. Actually, According to like the orthodox definition of what good codes are, these are not even good codes, unless you use hyperbolic space. But we're going to do all Euclidean. Um, 
let's consider an arbitrary graph. I don't mean a graph like a plot of a function. I mean like a diagram you would make of a network. Right? So it's got vertices. It's got edges. Here's E1. There's another one. It's called E2. Uh, there's some other edges coming out from every vertex. And uh, we can consider these E1 and E2 to be part of a cycle. There are some other edges around here that complete the cycle. Um, the intersection between the neighborhood of this vertex and the set of edges in this cycle is always two. Anytime you're on a cycle and you stop at one of the corners of the cycle, it has an incoming edge and an outgoing edge. So if I were to put qubits on these edges, and I were to put x stabilizers on these vertices, and z stabilizers on some of the cycles, oh boy, they would commute. Pretty weird, but we will do any weird thing in order to make the stabilizers commute. Uh, perfect. Uh, what is the n of this code? We don't know. What is the k? No clue. What's the distance? Who oh boy. But I've made the stabilizers commute. Uh, you have to add a little bit more mathematical sanity in order to be able to say what the um, n, k, and d of such a code are. OK, and here's where I run out of material early, and we go into questions. But I'm sure there are going to be questions. Oh, let's erase this garbage. We're going to do another code that has like just as many qubits, but we will not have nearly as bad a time writing out stabilizers, because we're using topology. Let us imagine that the graph we select is going to be a square tiling uh, of a torus. Torus code. Uh, there's a bunch of algebra that I should put here, but this diagram more or less captures everything. Okay. The Torah code is a special type of homological code. Homological codes are a special type of CSS codes. So you can see that we're drilling down from the general to the specific. And the Torah code is more or less state of the art. There are lots of groups working on the Torah. Well, okay, on relatives of the Torah code that you can cut and stretch out onto one sheet. So you can put everything on a single chip. But the Torah code is close enough for government work. Here's how you draw a torus. Okay. That's, you know, if you, if you go to like your first postdoc, you learn how to draw a torus. Now, how do we tile it? Okay. And then there's going to be extra, like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's definitely close enough. Uh, our vertices are going to be here. So we're going to wind up with X stabilizers that are weight four on these edges, right? X, 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 X. And we're going to wind up with, where have I got a nice square? Here's a nice square. So sometimes you see these called plaquettes, or faces, or tiles. I will have Z, 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 Z. And sure enough, wherever one of these squares intersects one of the vertices, it always hits two edges. Now, uh, the let's see. I think the homological topological part of it is where you say, not all cycles in my graph are going to be Z stabilizers. Uh, only the topologically trivial cycles right, that, that, don't, that don't loop around the torus. Right? You can imagine if you were trying to pick up a kettlebell and you, you tried to like palm it, it wouldn't work. But if you grab it by the handle, that works. Yeah? So if you, if you grab around this, uh, let me do a dotted line through here. Right, so loops around here are going to be logical operators. And there are partner loops that I can't draw in 3D, but I do know how to draw in 2D. So I'm going to do one more diagram, and then we're going to call it a day. Well, up to questions. Let's draw another torus. This is actually my favorite way to draw a torus. OK, so again, we will have. X stabilizers. By the way, okay, so this is a Pac-Man style torus. If Pac-Man walked off this edge here, it would come back on here. And if it 
went over here, he would come back on over here. That's what makes it a torus, right? You can imagine these different cut edges are wrapped around so that they, uh, so that they fuse together. I, again, have Z stabilizers here. And you can read about this in chapter 19 of Ladarnbrunn. By the way, just because this explanation is by necessity extremely rushed. Let's find our logical operators. So, well, okay, I can't resist doing cool stuff. If I put one x error here, this square stabilizer would get a minus one on it, and so would this one, right? Now if I put another x here, that cancels this out, because now this has got weight too, but Pac-Man is walking back over, right? If I put another x here, the thing moves again, and if I put another x here, this moves over here and cancels with this, right? So my logical operator is given by sort of like walking between sites of the torus, right? And I have this length four topologically non-trivial loop that goes all the way around one of the handles. Likewise, if I put Zs, right, it activates this vertex unless I put another Z, Z, Z. That wraps all the way around. And I can do the same thing on horizontal edges, Z, 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 and X, 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 to wind up with a, in this case, 16 to 4 Tor code. But in general, N squared, or sorry, let me go D squared to D because you can stretch the dimensions of the torus, just tile a bigger lattice, and get whatever distance you want, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, very granular, and the stabilizers are always low weight, so they're easy to measure with circuits, and that's what makes this code you know, a nice high threshold option for near-term memory experiments and, and state-of-the-art stuff like that. So, given that, I will end a little bit early, and we can take 10 minutes for questions or whatever other topics you are interested in in quantum error correction. The crowd is bummed now. I know. These people are ready for dinner. Oh, my. My God. We're going to have to wait a little longer, but before we have dinner and Good another luck, session, <laughs> let's have some questions. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, so how do we entangle these logical qubits? That's a, uh, that's, that's a, a, a sort of Pandora's box. Yeah, okay, so Kiran is gonna talk about it a little bit. Long story short, with CSS codes, there's a transversal CNOT. So if you can run a CNOT between qubit k in block one and qubit k in block two, and you do that for all k, uh, then as long as you've got two blocks of the same CSS code, then all of the uh, logical qubits become in, in, in block one become entangled with all the logical qubits in block two. Uh, and that's, that's for block to block entanglement. If you want to generate entanglement within a block, you can do that by hook or by crook. Uh, so there are some codes where, actually, okay, I should have got this paper done before I came here, but we have a paper coming out in a little bit where we have a, a code on eight qubits that sit on the vertices of a cube, and if you flip the top face, it does a logical CNOT between two of the logical qubits. So that kind of thing happens sometimes. Uh, there's, there are also um, gates that you can do in, well, okay, some people call this fusion-based quantum computing, some people call this lattice surgery, although it doesn't always involve a lattice, but if you can measure projectively a joint logical operator then you can, uh, you can project the system into a, a subspace. Well, okay, and if you, if you begin with an extra stabilizer that you don't need, you can measure a logical that anti-commutes with that stabilizer, right? So then you have a different stabilizer and your logicals change, and you can perform cycles of those operations, right? Always measuring something that anti-commutes with your current stabilizer, and gradually your logicals become different, 
right? So you can execute a logical Clifford by doing these repeated anti-commuting measurements. And you can do that within a block as well, provided that your code has reasonably low distance compared to its stabilizer weight. Otherwise, you're going to have to use really ugly circuits that propagate errors in bad ways, and it won't work. But for a distance four code with weight eight stabilizers, it ought to be fine. Thank you. And sorry, one more question. So does symmetry play a role in finding these stabilizers at all, or not really? Oh, yeah. Any, any symmetry you can bring to bear uh, will play a role in finding stabilizers. There are people that uh, will uh, dive to the most mathematical depths in search of ways to generate commuting stabilizers that produce a high distance code. So for example, um, you can put, if you want to fix the, uh, the fact that the number of logical qubits here is constant, right? There's always, there's always two logical qubits because there's only two ways you can go around the whole of a torus. Um, in order to create families of codes with what's called constant rate, where the number of logical qubits is in a constant ratio with the number of physical qubits, which is a lot better right, than having just a constant number of, of logicals. Um, you can use uh, manifolds that have hyperbolic characteristics. Right? So they're, they're sort of like uh, lettuce, right? where they, they get very curly towards the edge, because most of their uh, bulk is near the boundary. And well, OK, lettuce is not closed up into a torus. But if it was, uh, then you would observe that you need many holes in order to connect all of that boundary to itself. Uh, and those many holes produce many logical qubits. Uh, let's see. What were we talking about? Uh, symmetries and how it plays a role in finding these different stabilizers. Um, yeah, let's see. Are hypergraph product codes like really symmetric? I, I don't think, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, uh, and symmetries also play a huge role in finding logical gates. So if you want to show that there's some logical Clifford or non-Clifford, uh, then like advanced symmetries other than just you know the Pauli group and the Clifford group can come into it for sure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay. Oh, you make me run. Yeah, okay. What was that? I was just wondering, is there any proven, um, I guess, difference in efficiency between CSS codes and other kinds of codes, considering the CSS codes kind of stratify their um, X stabilizers and their Z stabilizers compared to something like the five qubit cyclic code you mentioned? Mm. That's a good question. So there are, especially when you deal with mostly small codes, like, like we do at the office, you wind up finding that these codes are like equivalent to each other under certain transformations. So uh, for example, there's a, well, okay, so there's a, there's a way to construct the Steen code from a five qubit version of a cut up uh, toric code. There's, there's a construction of the five qubit code from the toric code where uh, instead of, okay, so some people are crazy. And instead of putting the boundaries here and here at 90 degrees to the lattice, they'll like, they'll make a grid that's sort of like this and then put boundaries like here. And if you do it right, I haven't done it right, but you can arrange it so that uh, these four corners each have an edge coming in, and then there's one square in the middle, right? So it looks kind of like this. And that gives you a code with five qubits that's still topological. Uh, and it turns out to have the same stabilizer group as the 513 code. Is this important? Nobody knows. Um, but yeah, should we be using CSS codes or non-CSS codes? Hard to say. Uh, CSS codes have, in general, probably a little bit worse rate, but the decoding problem splits up into two smaller problems, right? You can say where the Z errors are and where the X errors are sort of independently. And uh, the influence of that 
property on uh, doing actual error correction in practice, not well understood. There are some pros and some cons to it. CSS codes tend to have more logical Cliffords. So they have uh, logical CNOTs from block to block that you can do transversally. Um, Non-CSS codes don't always have those. So you wind up having to use more awkward and clumsy constructions when you're trying to get a logical CNOT. Um, okay, self-dual CSS codes where each Z stabilizer has a partner X stabilizer also have a transversal Hadamard. Right, if I ran a Hadamard on every qubit, my ZZZZ would be replaced with XXXX and vice versa, but these operators would be generating the same group afterwards. And the logicals would also switch, so it would do a logical Hadamard. Non-CSS code, that's not guaranteed. Uh, there are theorems that you can do phase, the remaining Clifford, you know, nobody's favorite Clifford. Um, as long as your generators are weight zero mod four with uh, uh, CSS codes. So you can get all Clifford's transversal, and transversal gates are extremely reliable, especially when you're talking about transversal single qubit gates. Right? Single qubit gates have huge fidelity, and if you need two or more of them to fail in order to produce a logical error, when you're writing out a logical computation and you have transversal single qubit Cliffords, you can more or less ignore them. Right? You can act like the error rate is zero for the purpose of calculating actual failure rates in the device. So those are all arguments in favor of uh, CSS codes. Yeah, and then I guess the argument in favor of non-CSS codes is you can save two qubits. But, I mean, you'll notice, all right, 513 beats 713, but 1644 beats 513, because I'm, on average, using four physicals per logical, and my distance is one unit higher, right? So uh, if two errors occur, I'm going to be able to tell and it's like, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, unknown unknowns and known unknowns. A known unknown is a lot better than an unknown unknown. So if a weight two error happens in a distance three code, and you think a weight one error happened, then you correct and you put in some unknown logical operator, you've sabotaged the rest of your computation. You might be, you might be doing, you know, a million more gates, but you've destroyed your state very early on, and it's all wasted effort, and you have no idea. Uh, with an even distance code, if two errors happen, then in principle, or with, with a distance four code, if two errors happen, in principle, that gives you a unique signature. You can say, ah, I don't know what to do, right? It's like getting an error message rather than having some thing that you think is not a real error, you think is correctable. Uh, so you can stop the computation and start again. Or at least post-select out those garbage runs from, uh, from whatever subsequent computation you're trying to do on the output. Uh, and that can be used to increase like logical fidelity a lot in ways that mm, probably are not yet appreciated. At least I hope, because we're going to put out some papers on this. Got it. So to recap, CSS codes are just op operationally and computationally just a lot more easy. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. There's a, yeah, there's also a lot of people that will use like codes that are not quite CSS, but are locally Clifford equivalent to a CSS code. So if you see like Clifford deformation, uh, normally that's being applied to a CSS code to make the stabilizer something other than all X's and all Z's, but you still get the same divvying up of, of error correction uh, gadgets and you still get the same logical gates. You just have to undo that weird Clifford at the beginning and then redo it at the end. Okay, nice. So thank you. Any more questions? I think that's good now. Um, thank you very much, Ben, for your... Okay. I respect that this lecture...